Hey, good afternoon, everybody. So, we're here to talk about uh, artificial intelligence, specifically to address some of the hype, hopes, and concern about its recent renaissance. You know, uh, back in the 1950s, when people started thinking about artificial intelligence, including uh, Marvin Minsky, who recently died. I'm wearing a little button to honor him here. Um, uh, people thought we would have machines being humanly intelligent, match human intelligence within a few years. And that didn't happen, and they tried a lot of things, and went, we went through what was called an AI winter. And now, it seems, we're in AI hot tropical rainforest. It's, it's everywhere. And people are a little alarmed at it in some cases, as well as excited about uh, the prospects here. So I'm really happy, and you know, kind of, we're all lucky to hear from Stephen Wolfram here, who's you know, really one of our top scientists, uh, a, a great thinker, um, a great writer. He just published something amazing on backchannel.com yesterday about a, uh, a mathematician, and um, uh, also somewhat of an entrepreneur. Uh, you know, some of you, I'm sure, are familiar with Mathematica. So hi, Stephen, and welcome. Hi there. So I would assume that you're pretty optimistic about what AI can do. Following your work, it seems the spine of it is that the universe is made of computation. So I would assume that you would think we're going to get a lot of traction in making machines intelligent. You know, I think AI as it is right now is just a, it, it comes from a long tradition. You know, the technology has been about automating things. You know, we take things which we as humans have been able to do, and then we automate them. We get machines to do them for us. And, you know, what's happening with AI is just a, a, a thing on that progression. What, what ends up happening is, you know, we have to define the goals. What is it we want to achieve? Then the role of people who build technology, like me, is to make it as automatic as possible to achieve those goals. It's not something where there is an intrinsic goal. There's something where, you know, we build the smartest possible AI. It will know what it's supposed to do. There's no sense in which the AI itself has an intrinsic goal. You know, I happen to have spent a lot of time studying kind of the science of computation and kind of its relationship not only to uh, uh, things we build in technology but also to the natural world. And I'm uh, really very certain that we can think well about the natural world in terms of computation. So, you know, the, the, the little aphorism, aphorism is, you know, the weather has a mind of its own, mm -hmm. okay? That seems like, you know, return to animism or something like this, but actually it's an interesting scientific statement because what's basically saying is that the, the weather is doing a computation just like our computers are doing computations or our brains are doing computations. Mm -hmm. It's all the same kind of thing that's happening. So I think it's, it's uh, in that sense, we're, what, what we're doing is we're, we're taking in technology, we're trying to harness this thing that is computation and make it achieve the goals that we as humans define. It's interesting. I, I guess the, we're burning a lot of cycles today with the, the, the thunderstorm. Yes, you know. yes, right, exactly. But, but wait a minute, but if, if even the weather has a mind of its own and, these, and computation is natural, so to speak, not you know, built yeah. by organisms, but you know, just out there as part of the universe's complexity. Why can't we have artificially intelligent things, things that we build that do have purposes, that do have goals? What does it mean for something to have a goal? You tell me. So, I mean, it's interesting because almost anything that happens in the world, you can think of in terms of its mechanism or you can think of it in terms of its purpose. I mean, so, so now we're about to go into real-time philosophy, but let, let, me, let me say a few things about that because I think it's kind of interesting. You know, if you say, uh, here's a, I'm going to throw a ball, okay, the ball follows some parabolic trajectory, you can say the reason it does that is because it has some mechanism. It follows some differential equation that every moment says the ball should move in this way. You can also say that the ball is going to follow a trajectory that minimizes the action quantity in mechanics. Okay, so in a sense, the ball is achieving a purpose of minimizing that action quantity. Those are two different ways of talking about what the ball is doing. One is by mechanism, the other is by purpose. And this dichotomy between mechanism and purpose, I mean, you go back, look at, you know, Aristotle was talking about the same things. We've been talking about the same stuff for thousands of years. Um, but so it's not really knowing if a thing has a purpose 
there's no intrinsic sense in which a thing will have a purpose. You can say, how do we explain what it does? We can explain what a person does by virtue of their achieving this purpose. We can also explain it in terms of they are, you know, something happens in their brain chemistry that causes this to happen, that causes that to happen. It's a mechanism. So it's a, purpose is a very slippery thing. And when you, you know, if you look at a thing, like you look at Stonehenge, for example, you say, was it built for a purpose? Mm. Hard to know. Actually, my favorite of this type is we think about extraterrestrial intelligence, and we think about, you know, let's say we had an extraterrestrial intelligence that could, you know, move stars around in the sky, uh -huh. okay? What would it choose to do? You know, what would, what would be a way of moving stars around in the sky where we could know that those stars had been put there for a purpose? Mm -hmm. It wasn't just some natural thing that caused them to be that way. They were put there for a purpose. It's a complicated issue. I mean, basically, purpose ends up being defined as something that comes out of some long kind of cultural history. It's not, a, it's not a thing where you can say, this thing has a purpose, that doesn't have a purpose. There's a bit more to say about this, and the philosophers have been writing right. about this for thousands of years, but, yeah, but, but that's But to ground it to artificial intelligence, so basically there's two big concerns about AI. And the first is that it's going to kill us. Yes. And the second is, it's going to take all our jobs, right? So the, the, the first one is, is if you're you know, optimistic, say, about what AI can do, then you know, it will be whether it has this theological sense of purpose or not that we're talking about. Uh, you know, at some point uh, in some singularity kind of voodoo, it's going to say, you know, well, so much for humans, we're taking it from here, and they're not really necessary for us. Do you buy that? I think it's complicated. I think that, you know, one could certainly make mistakes with AI. You know, one of the things that's interesting is, okay, you say, let's make ethical AI. What on earth does that mean? You know, how do we define what ethics, you know, what is, I was thinking, let's curate the ethics systems of the world. You know, in Wolfram Alpha, we curate all kinds of things. I was thinking, let's just collect all the ethical codes that people have developed over the course of history. Is this something you've done? Them. Not yet, no, but I've been thinking <laughs> about doing it. But then, then you realize, okay, so here's a simple issue. Let's say that the AI is able to produce, to create a certain happiness distribution for people. So it can say, you know, some, you know, there's a certain, maybe a total happiness. And this would be world. a goal that a human told it to do. Yes, but I mean, I'm, I'm just saying, even if we say, let's build in, you know, an ethics box in all our AIs, you know, what, what, would, uh -huh. what does it do? Right, so we say, let's build in what the sculpted happiness distribution of the world's population should be if the AIs were in control. So do you decide you make some people very happy, some people very unhappy, everybody of average happiness? What do you do? There's no right answer. You know, this is a, a thing that's been debated in different sort of systems and cultures forever. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I realize that I don't think there's a, you know, you could also say, well, let's use machine learning. Let's have, you know, the ethics learnt by the AIs watching movies or watching what people do. Right. right? It's probably a pretty bad idea, too. So they're probably doing it at Google, I'm sure. <laughs> it's, it's uh, you know, I think... Uh, you shouldn't get me started on that. Um, <laughs> well, that's, that's now it. we're going to <laughs> it's, it's, be um, um, But, but um, uh, you know, I, I think the, um, I mean, this is an interesting problem of, of kind of how do we imbue, you know, we, we are trying to build technology that can achieve our purposes, mm -hmm. and how do we define, for example, our ethical purposes for, the, for purposes of an AI? I think in terms of the, you know, will they eat us? Will they take our jobs? Mm -hmm. You know, certainly in the next few years, a lot of sort of white collar jobs that have been based on human judgment will be better done by machines. Right, right. Well, we hear this one uh, prediction that came out of your home country uh, somewhere uh, uh, that two thirds of the jobs that people have uh, over, I guess, a 20 year period, some period, um, is, could, be, will, could and will be replaced by automation. Does that seem reasonable to you? I don't know. I've, I've looked at actually, uh, I did a bit of a study of trying to look at the trends over the last hundred years or so. Um, the, the job categories have changed, so you have to kind of merge things together. But it's interesting to see what's happened over the last hundred mm. years. You know, agriculture went way down. Manufacturing actually didn't go down as much as you would think. Everything to do with government went up. Things to do with healthcare went up, at least in the nursing sector and so mm -hmm. on. So, you know, there, there are trends like that. You know, these things tend to be, uh, so I think the really interesting thing is, what will we be doing in the future? That is, some of the jobs that we have now, some of the things that we do now, you know, in the past, there were things people were doing which don't make any sense to do anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, I think one of the things- Like, like what, what do you mean? Like 
Well, a lot of agricultural kinds of things, it's right. like you just have a machine that does that or you just have more efficient crops right. and so on. You know, I think the interesting question for me is, if you look at what we do today, a lot of what we do today would seem absolutely pointless to somebody from a thousand years ago. Hmm. I mean, you know, we, we, you know, we walk on a treadmill. Why on earth would somebody walk on a treadmill? What a crazy thing to do. You know, because that really you know, brilliant weather with a purpose is raining on us. Yeah, 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 is... right, right. We, but, um, but, you know, it's, it's like in the past, you know, one of the concerns is, okay, well, when everything is automated, uh, you know, humans don't have to do very much. Well, how are you going to automate exercise? You know, where, where are you picking? Well, that, that's a different issue. I mean, it's the kind of the, the biology, you know, at what point, I mean, one of, the, one of the big drivers of human purpose today is human mortality, finite lifespan. Uh -huh. And, you know, as, you know, whether, you know, one thing we will see, which will surely be sort of the biggest discontinuity in history ever, is when people effectively achieve immortality. Do you think that's going to happen? Uh, absolutely, it will happen. Really? Whether it will happen in time for somebody like me is unclear, <laughs> but um, um, will it happen? Of course it will happen. I mean, whether it will happen in a digital form or a biological form or a merger of those forms is not clear. And what it will mean when it happens is also not clear. I mean, my kind of vision, my slightly pessimistic vision, to my mind, of the future is, you know, the kind of the box of a trillion souls. You know, you've kind of got the, uh, uh, you've got sort of the human condition, it's virtualized, you've got all sort of human consciousness represented digitally, it's nice, it's easy to back up, it's all, you know, all good. And you've got this box of a trillion souls. And then the question is, you're looking at this box, and the box has all these atomic processes going on and all these electrons moving around and so on. And then next to the box, there's a rock. And the rock also has all kinds of atomic processes and electrons and so on going around. And you ask yourself, what's the difference between the box of a trillion souls and the rock? And the answer is, the box of a trillion souls came out of this whole long history of human civilization and has kind of the, uh, you know, the details of our history encoded in it. The rock, well, it has the details of geological history encoded in it, mm. but it seems a lot less interesting to us. Mm. But it's also, you know, there's the question of, is that, is that a very pessimistic view of kind of the end of history? It and, doesn't uh, thrill me to think I'm going to be one of a trillion souls in a box. Yeah, well, right. But, but you get to do, you know, you get to explore our actual, you know, a virtualized version of our actual universe. You get to explore the universe of all possible universes. Mm. You get to do whatever you want which to many people, it's like doing whatever you want seems like a good thing. You know, so I, I became less pessimistic about this. I, I was kind of really pessimistic about uh -huh. this a little while ago. And then I was thinking about, you know, what would, if you go back a thousand years and you say, so, so in a sense, the sort of the trillion souls in a box, it's like everybody's just playing video games all the time. Uh, well, like the Matrix, you yes, know, where people yes. are sitting there, you know, in, in fetal position in some sort of solution you know, while, you know, in virtual reality somewhere, their consciousness is right. doing all this fun stuff and dodging bullets. Right. But I mean, you know, so, so in a sense, it's like everybody's just playing a video game. Mm -hmm. And then you say, well, that seems kind of pointless. But then if you think back a thousand years and you say, what would a person a thousand years ago think of what we do today? The slightly depressing thing to realize, a lot of what we do today would seem like kind of playing video games. Mm. Because it's like, you know, a thousand years ago, people were worrying about, you know, almost everybody was worrying about whether they get their next meal, how do they survive, you know, all these kinds of things, which for a lot of people is not an immediate issue. Um, so, I, you know, but I, I felt a little bit less pessimistic because in today's world, it seems like we're doing things that are purposeful, even though from looking from a thousand years ago, it might seem like what we're doing today is not purposeful. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of makes one feel more optimistic that it will at least feel okay mm -hmm. in the future. Hmm. Well, let me take what you do and maybe circle back to artificial intelligence. Yeah, I'm sorry, you know, I'm, you've been, I'm just... Um, you've been blowing my mind, Stephen. Uh, but, you know, so if these, you know, basically what unnerves people about artificial intelligence, I think, is that we feel that we have a, a monopoly on consciousness. Yes. You know, we're behaving like we're conscious. And, you know, uh, somehow we think of a human being as, you know, like, like a mix of that consciousness and our phys physical presence, you know. Our, uh, and what you're describing here is really no physical presence, right? Yes. And something which maintains the consciousness. To be, to a lot of people, the big hurdle on all the singularity stuff is that they say computers can never have 
consciousness. That, that's, that's just something that, that, that won't go. And to a lot of scientists, uh, that rankles them because they feel that that's a form of vitalism, that, you know, kind of belief in a soul, it doesn't bother them. Are, so are you telling me that you are, you know, believe that that, that is the case? That, you know, no, so, it, so it, people, basically a, mach, a machine process that we can create can be conscious and generate that? Yeah, I mean, people have said, you know, I've been involved in doing things which would now be called AI for, I don't know, 40 years or so now, and people are always saying, computers will never be able to do X. And when computers can do X, then we'll know they've really achieved whatever. Mm. And, you know, it used to be doing symbolic integrals, then it was, you know, composing interesting music, then it was doing all kinds of other things. So, you know, at a practical level, we keep on achieving these things. Now, if you ask, you know, will we have consciousness in a box, so to speak, um, I think the answer is, well, first question is, what do you mean by consciousness? The second thing to realize is you start thinking about sort of a progression, and I see it as going from defining life to defining intelligence to defining consciousness. And life is an easier case to talk about because you say, okay, is something alive, is it not alive? On Earth, it's pretty easy to tell because you go look at it, you go see, you know, it has RNA in it, it's got all kinds of detailed biological molecules and so on. You know, that's alive and this is not alive. Now you go, you know, when I was a kid, there was the first Mars landers were, were landing, and they had these experiments to try and figure out whether the Martian soil was full of life or not. And kind of one of the best experiments was you feed it sugar and you see whether it metabolizes. Now, is that really the abstract definition of life? Probably not. You know, the Greeks said, you know, if it moves itself, then it must be alive. Then there were steam engines and things. So what we realize in the end is there is no good abstract definition of life. There's a historical definition that's particular to our terrestrial situation mm. that life has biological molecules and so on. Similarly with intelligence. You know, is there a notion of intelligence that is divorced from our particular intelligence with our particular history? That comes up importantly when you talk about extraterrestrial intelligence. You know, do we know whether that weird signal that we get from this uh, you know, particular radio emitting star, mm. do we know if that's intelligence? Or is it just merely a physical process, like the weather, which has a mind of its own, so to speak? Mm -hmm. And you know, it gets more and more slippery, and I think consciousness is an even more slippery version of this. And I think you know, when you say people are, you know, throughout history, people have said, we're special. You know, our Earth is at the center of the universe, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's really a good thing. You know, I like to think we're special. I like to think uh -huh. that, but I just don't think it's true. Um, I mean, I think that the, um, you know, when you look at any of the sort of criteria of saying, well, this is what you mean by having this box of consciousness, I think what you realize is you're going to achieve that in some digital form. Now, when you look at a human brain or something and you say, well, there's magic things going on in the human brain, it won't be that long before we can see, you know, our hundred trillion neurons up on some big dashboard mm -hmm. where, you know, whatever I'm thinking right now, you'll be able to see there's some wave of activation that's starting here and I'm trying to figure out what the next word is. And, you know, it'll be, it's very unmysterious in some sense because there'll be a giant kind of, this is what every neuron is doing. So you might say, okay, if that's the case, then what's the point? Mm -hmm. Well, the point is that, that this computation that's going on to figure out you know, what will be the next word I say or whatever else, it's an irreducible computation. In other words, you might think if we can see every step, then it's all trivial and we might just be able to say, uh, you know, let's just jump ahead and get to, the, you know, get to the end, just get to the point, so to speak, right. without going through little steps. But one of the sort of fundamental facts that's come out of a bunch of basic science, including a bunch of stuff I've spent many years yeah. doing, is that there's this notion of irreducible computation, that there's, right. no, there's no shortcut. Right. So we're, we're, we're out of time here, but I'm going to ask you one, one question that try to do a very short answer before, the, before they throw us off here. Um, you've been talking very much like a, like a scientist. To a lot of people, this uh, debate is a very visceral one. I've known you for a lot of years, right? And I, I'm just kind of curious. Has having a family and having children affected your thinking about the, the subject at all? You know, it, it's funny because there are a lot of things that I've concluded scientifically where I hate the answers I'm getting. Hmm. And it's, it's a very frustrating thing because, you know, I keep on, I'm an optimistic guy and I keep on coming up with kind of pessimistic uh -huh. conclusions. So that's been, you know, I'm, I'm still trying to come to terms with that issue. Okay. Well, thank you, Stephen. It has been amazing. Thanks. <laughs>